and so he finally started his own company, or co-founded, sorry, Dropwise, last year, with a couple of professors from MIT, and he specializes in heat transfer and manufacturing, so today he's going to talk about how to fix a power plant using nothing but vapors. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to talk about trucks. I want to talk about how I'm going to use a handful of trucks like this to solve two of the biggest problems that are facing my generation, namely climate change and water scarcity. Because there's a common thread that ties these two problems together. It's power plants. You see, power plants are actually the single largest source of emissions on the planet. And they're the second largest withdrawer of water on the whole planet. And this is because power plants, almost all of them, 80%, still generate power using steam turbines, which need a ton of fuel and a ton of water. Uh, so let me quickly walk you through how a steam plant works. So you start with a fuel. It could be uh, conventional coal or natural gas, or it could be more renewable biomass, solar thermal. And you use that heat to boil water and make steam and shove it through the steam turbine to spin a generator and unfortunately generating emissions in the process. And so the efficiency of this power plant is now given as the electricity you get out divided by the fuel energy you have to put into the plant. And so for the past couple of centuries, people have looked for all sorts of ways to squeeze more energy out of the steam since after it leaves the system, it just used to exit the turbine. So a little over 100 years ago, a clever guy by the name of James Watt figured out that the easiest way to squeeze more energy out of the steam is to put a condenser behind it. This condenses the steam back down into liquid water, which pulls the steam faster through the turbine, making it generate more efficiently. And so you can now produce the same amount of electricity with less fuel, which is great because now you can lower your emissions if you're burning a fossil fuel. But now you're stuck with having to pump a ton of cooling water through this condenser. And because the, the steam is dumping the heat into the cooling water, it's going to warm up unless you have some other way of taking the thermal energy out of your cooling water. And so the way this is usually done is by taking that warmed up coolant and spraying it in the bottom of these huge cooling towers. And as the drops fall through the air, some of it evaporates and cools the rest of the drop off, sort of like sweat cools you when it evaporates. So now to cool your coolant off, you're actually losing water by evaporation out the top. So you have to suck up water from a pond or a lake or a river or something. So now we have this dilemma. We have a trade-off of making your steam loop more efficient, but you have to sacrifice coolant water in order to make this happen. And the crux of this problem, the one that links the two together, is the condenser. And there's a fundamental problem with this condenser. When the steam condenses, it covers the surface of that condenser in a blanket of liquid, which is terrible at conducting heat. So you can solve this problem by putting a liquid repellent coating on the outside of the tube. It breaks up the film of water, the heat transfer shoots up by 700%, and so now your plant is generating electricity way more efficiently. And so uh, this is old news. People have tried to make coatings like this happen for almost a century now. But nothing's been able to work because until now, nothing has been able to solve the three fundamental challenges of getting a coating like this to work. First, it's got to be really, really thin. Otherwise, the coating itself acts as a blanket for the condenser. Even a micron is too thick here. Second, of course, it's got to be very durable. Uh, steam is an incredibly aggressive environment and degrades most coatings within a matter of minutes. And last, it's got to be really, really cheap because the plant wants to make back the expense of applying the coating very fast. So last year, we uh, talked about a material innovation that let us solve these first two challenges. It's a polymer film that's tens of nanometers thick, so we have excellent thermal performance and it's actually covalently grafted to the metal oxide of the tube. And preliminary accelerated endurance trials are projecting lifetimes of at least five years. And within the last six months, we finally invented a way to solve the last and most challenging problem, how to get the coating on all these tubes. 
the crux of the issue is that this thing is enormous. There's a little guy for scale reference. It has hundreds of miles of tubes in it. And this is the point where all the previous technologies have failed because everyone's tried to do this with a liquid-based coating, which is never going to work because it's either too expensive, too slow, or too thick. So you can think about trying to like, come to this power plant with a bunch of pre-coated tubes, pull these tubes out and stick the new coated ones. To do that for all 10, 20,000 tubes is going to take several weeks, and these plants are only down for a week at a time, so that's out. You have to find a way to coat the entire bundle all at once. So you can think about trying to spray on the coating, but you're never going to be able to get the coating thicker than a couple microns, which is already way too thick. And so the last thing that's left if you want to coat it with a liquid is to flood the condenser and have the coating molecules adsorb to the surface. But you've got to come up with half a million gallons of liquid. So we innovated ourselves out of this challenge with a completely different approach. We don't need a liquid. We started with this vapor-based process developed by the Gleason lab at MIT, where we flow in a few precursors to this polymer film in the vapor phase and strike a thermally mediated polymerization reaction that deposits the coatings directly onto the tubes. So you need two things for this process. First, you need a vacuum chamber to control the pressure. And second, you need good control of the temperature. And so at this time last year, we were pretty worried that we'd have to come up with a huge chamber to put this huge bundle in. But then you take a closer look at the, con at the condenser, and it is a vacuum chamber whose whole purpose is to manage temperature and pressure. So now we can think about pulling up to this condenser with a mobile deposition unit, basically some pumps, some air handlers, and vapor delivery manifold, and apply the coating directly into the condenser in a single step fast enough to fit in within an existing maintenance downtime window. And this innovation is what let everything else fall into place because now it's so cheap to apply the coating that you can come back after a few years and reapply it if necessary. So now our durability requirement to get this coating throughout the entire lifetime of the plant goes from half a century down to a few years. And this single truck coating a single plant is offsetting enough emissions that's equal to taking several thousand cars off the road. And this thing is driving around coating a new plant every week. And so with just a handful of these trucks, just 10 trucks a year, within four years, we can offset emissions equal to all of the solar panels installed across the entire world last year. Not bad for a handful of trucks. Wow. Thanks. I'm impressed that including the Portland cement story, we're still solving sort of the same problems as Thomas Edison did. A lot of people here, so Smart that's guys. cool. Yeah, right. Um, does it do anything to the water? Does it, as it comes off, does it go in the water? Does it pollute the water? What's, no, the, it, what's the environmental downside, if any? So it doesn't actually flake off, and the material we're using, it's, it's, a, it's a type of polymer that you, you wear it every day, so its toxicity is not high at all. And there's, there's, it's so thin that the, the entire volume of coating in an entire, say, 300 megawatt plant is a couple liters. So e even if it does get into the water, it's in the process water of the plant and at a lower than PPB level. I'm curious about the scalability. What does it mean from 10 trucks to go to 20 trucks and so on? Is it difficult or? That's what we're working on right now, sort of cost models about what it takes to build these systems. So we're, we're at the point of scaling up right now and sort of making those estimates right now. So I hope to be able to answer that question in a few months. OK. <laughs> Thank you. So um, how long do you think uh, you'll take to commercialize this? So we're at a bench scale uh, stage of basically scaling up the process, getting it to a meter and then several meters. And so the, the most difficult part, of course, is getting these pilot studies to work because uh, first we have to find the, the guinea pig plant and we have our hands on a couple of them already. And we're getting a sense of how long they want to see these durability tests taken out to. 
And luckily, there are a lot of coal plants out there which are shutting down in a couple of years, which are the perfect test beds for this because their, their risk tolerance is now pretty good. So we're, we're thinking within a couple of years, we're going to be at the several meter pilot scale. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it, it makes the biggest difference for coal plants. And as, as we've gone over earlier today, uh, the coal plant difference is now in India and China.